Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. I see it. Ah, yeah, now I see him. Yes. I think we can start. Yeah. All right. You can hear me well? Yes. Okay, perfect. The lunch slot, where you're all <laughs> digesting stuff. Brilliant. All right. Welcome to our talk titled Building an Enterprise Product on Top of Spring Boot. In this story, we're going to tell you how we built our open source project. We made it an enterprise product and how we did it all using Spring Boot and some other things. My name is Joram Barres and I'm very honored to, to be here today with my friend and co-worker Philip Lisafov uh, here in Barcelona Spring I.O. It's been, for me, this is the third time. It's been a couple of years since I presented here, so it's really cool to be back here. You can read our credentials there on the screen. Not important for this talk. <laughs> so as a society and a species, we progress by learning uh, from others. Um, thinking about science, thinking about culture, art, you know, um, uh, music, and software development. And that's where our story starts. We started at the end of 2016 as a fork of activity, where I used to work on in a past life. Um, this is not a talk on Flowable itself. Uh, suffice to say that Flowable is a popular open source, predominantly Java framework. If you're interested, go to flowable.org. Go to github.com slash flowable, you'll find all the information. But this is not a talk really on the details of Flowable. Just to give you a, a high level idea of what we do, we execute visual models. Uh, we did a talk last week on Voxt Zurich. Uh, there's 50 minutes where we talk really what is Flowable. There's a link at the bottom there. So if you want to see that, just go there. Uh, but this is not what we're going to talk about today. Just for this uh, presentation, it's important to know we take models that have been built by business people and technical people together, deploy them to what we call an engine, and you do things with it. You start instances, you complete tasks, you do a lot of things with it. Now, in isolation, that's not very interesting. It becomes really interesting when you do this on a high performance, high scale, millions per hours kind of thing. And we're very blessed that we have an active community um, that you know, challenges us, that adds new features, that continues to work with us to make the engine um, better every day. And if you would go to github.com and you would kind of check our, our Maven modules, you'll see that we have a lot of Spring Boot starters in the open source project. Um, not going to go into detail, that's something that Philip will do in a second, uh, but basically these allow you to pick and choose what you want depending on how much you need. Or you can just go with the, this one at the bottom, that gives you it all. Now, what a, the Shutter Starter does is it boots up the engine, right? I mean, not a global talk, but an engine executes this visual model. So if you add a dependency to your Spring Boot project, it basically integrates with everything that's there for Spring Boot. If you have a data source, it will use a data source. If you have transaction management, it will use transaction management. If you've exposed REST APIs, Flobo will expose its REST APIs. And obviously, we have a custom banner. So we were quite early adopters back in the day. Um, when Spring Boot 1 was released on April 1st, 2014, it only took us uh, less than two months to add the first integration, thanks to, you can see, nobody else than Josh Long, uh, to the engine. At that time, support was limited. We only had the process engine. For Spring Boot 2.0, for Spring 2.0, we had uh, Spring Boot 2.0, finally correct. We added starters for all the engines, and we were even faster. You know, the Phil Web posted on March 1, that Spring 2.0, Boot 2.0 was released, and less than a month later, Philip migrated everything to uh, Spring Boot 2. And we expanded all the starters from just the process engine to all the engines we had. And that was important because at that time, in March 2018, we were already building our enterprise product. But we'll talk about our enterprise product after Philip has shown yeah. what we have in open source. Yeah, so now let's see how we can use the starters that we have. Um, and build like a small flowable application. All right, so we are going to... Wait, it's not yet on the screen. It's not on the screen. <laughs> but it should be. <laughs> I don't know why it's not. It's mirror displayed. Uh, I don't know what's wrong. Try to turn it on and off again. And I can, <laughs> I can plug it and then plug back in. Yeah. 
It worked in the acceptance test environment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so two minutes. Uh, no, yeah, no. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we're going to create now a completely new project uh, using uh, the Spring Initializer. So this would be uh, Spring uh, your demo. We're going to use Java, Maven. Uh, we're going to use Java 11 uh, because we still have not set up our, our latest stuff to work on Java 17. And we are going to use Spring Boot 268 because 27 was released last week. And we don't want to fail during this demo, right? So we're going to add the actuator. We're going to add the H2 database. And we are going to add the Postgres database. We'll create the project now. And we now, so basically, this is how you would create a, pr a pr project for Flow. So you would go, you would create a normal Spring Boot project, and then we are going to add the versions that we need to add for Flow. So we're going to add the Flow version, which the current release is 6.7.2, and then we are going to add uh, one of our starters, which basically is the starter that or that Yora mentioned before. Um, Flowable version that would be the flowable Spring Boot starter REST. So this starter is the starter that brings everything. So this one will bring the REST APIs that we have, all the engines that we have, basically all, all, all the logic that we have and things like that. And now let's add some, some classes. So we're going to add a really simple logger service that is going to do nothing more. So we're going to expose this as a service. Uh, and it is going to do nothing more than just log something for us. And we will, we will, we will, it will log from our process, basically. So we apply public method and put this on the command line. So not, nothing, nothing fancy, right? We're going to have the project. I uh, have a uh, process ready, so this is basically the visual model that uh, Yoram mentioned earlier, uh, which is in the form of an XML file, and we are going to put this in a directory called processes. So this means that we ha our integration with Spring Boot allows us to, everything which is in these folders, it will be automatically deployed and made available on the runtime for the engine. And for just to show that things work properly, we are going to use our dependencies. So this we will add a command line runner, uh, which is going to consume uh, the configure dependencies for Fallable. So this is the runtime service, which is used to create new process instances, query data, and things like that. So we are going to create a process instance. Uh, process definition key, and just to make sure that I don't make any mistake, uh, I'm going to copy the key, and we were going to start it. And that's it. So now uh, we are going to run this service and to see what it, what it happens. So we are going to run our application. If everything is fine, we don't need to download the internet. I downloaded it before to make sure that. There are no problems now, but yeah. So as you can see, we, we see some logging from Flowable. We create the database tables, things like this, and we have our logging. So this is what was done from our service. We invoke this and we, we log that. So this is done here in the logger service where we basically invoke that bean and write that to message. So let's go now back to the slides. And hopefully that doesn't yeah. break. It probably breaks. Oh no, there it no, is. No, no, no. Just had to be patient. Yes. All right. So that was in a very quick, you know, quick tutorial demo uh, how you use the open source starters, how you use Flowable, um, and now we make the jump to how we build our enterprise product on top of what Philip just demoed. So if you would go to our website, flowable.com, you'll see basically three products. On the left-hand side, we've got basically what we call Flowable Orchestrate. This is uh, a supported version of the open source. There's some extra stuff to it, but basically this is you know, your typical kind of maintenance and supported open source version. In the middle, we've got what we call Flowable Work. This is our flagship product. This is really 
a user interface where people can see their task inbox, see their processes, and you know, do the, the classic kind of workflow-y stuff. And on the right-hand side, we've got Flowable Engage. This is when you want to mix in things like a uh, WhatsApp adapter and do tasks with it and stuff like that. Again, not a talk about Flowable, just to give some context about the stuff you'll see in a minute. Um, as a company, uh, this is what I just stole from our sales deck. We are over the whole world with 14 offices. There's more than 300 people. Um, so yeah, this is a company, um, this is the whole group, by the way, um, if you would go to our website. Uh, we've evolved from, from you know, a open source project into this while still doing every day the open source work. And how did we do that? Well, three years ago, we decided to release the first J version of our um, product. Um, since then, we've done 11 major releases and we've, we're doing a lot of minor releases. Uh, last year, 45, which is pretty much every week, uh, release. We're used all across the globe, many different industries, and from simple kind of task-driven flows to high-scale uh, concurrency with service orchestrations. But the foundation remains the open source engine. So everything that we do in the enterprise project uh, product is around the open source engines and the same starters that Philip just used. We have a lot of new engines in the enterprise product, but really important there is we follow the same architectural patterns. Um, one of the key things for us is repeatability and the fact that you can't be surprised. So if you know one engine, if you come from open source, you move into our enterprise product, it will just be the same. All the services are the same, all the patterns are the same, and that really speeds up things. From day one, we decided to use Spring Boot. Now, why did we do that? Well, actually, the only real alternative that we had at the time was plain old Spring without Boot. The reason was quite simple. In our team, we have a lot of people that know Spring. I myself do Spring since 2006, seven, something like that. So, you know, been around the Spring world for a while. But, you know, this is just not about us. We also had to make sure that customers that want to customize our stuff can do something. And even in 2019 already, when we were building this or releasing this, Spring Boot was already the predominant choice. This is from the JetBrain survey, that probably many people know. Um, already more than half you know, said Spring Boot, and then 43% you know, said Spring MVC, which you know, could be interpreted as pretty much the same at that point. But of course, it's not just about the code. What for us was really important for choosing Spring Boots is the things that we all like. You know, all the people in the room, I think you're already convinced of Spring and Spring Boot, otherwise you probably wouldn't have been here. So ecosystem. You know, you, can go and take from third parties or non-third parties, and it will be the same high quality, the same kind of patterns that you expect from Spring. Um, the problems that Spring Boot tackles are also the same problems that we have or our customers have. So it's quite convenient. We don't need to waste our time on that. Stability. I mean, we've always updated quite quickly, um, very fast for an enterprise product. I mean, the kind of customers that we have are you know, very enterprisey, big banks. They don't like to upgrade fast, yet we, whenever there's a release, we update it. Um, and we've never really had a major problem in all you know, those last three years that we've done so. So really, kudos to the Spring team for that. At the same time, they are keeping the innovation lit on, right? I mean, if you look this, at the sessions yesterday, today, all the stuff around Kubernetes, Spring Native, you know, they are continuing to innovate while keeping backwards compatibility, which is quite impressive. And of course, tooling. I mean, I'm you know, doing Java for a long time now, about 20 years. And back in the day, I used Emacs with some Java plugins. And if you see how that evolved into you know, IntelliJ with the Spring Boot support we have these days, it's incomparable. And that's really important if you compare the Spring Boot and Java kind of ecosystem tooling with some other languages that sometimes I have to work with. It's just non, no comparison possible. And if you look at the JetBrain survey, you know, the next year, you know, just uh, those numbers went up, you know, 2020, 61%, 2021, 65%. The numbers for 2022 are not out there, but probably is going to be rising again. So the choice for Spring Boot allowed us to fully focus on delivering our stuff, right? The process stuff, the visual model execution stuff that we think we're good at, right? Um, and it really speeds up our development efforts for us, but also our customers, as you'll see in the demo in a second. Now, this is a question we always get uh, whenever we do a talk. So I'm just, you know, we just made a slide out of it now. So people always ask us, so how do you then decide what goes into open source and what goes into enterprise? And we made a very clear decision there. Uh, we said, there's no compromises when it is around execution. And there goes the screen again. There you go. Ah, okay. Yeah. Maybe you have to keep your finger. 
keep your finger here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> when it's around execution of these models, it goes into open source, right? No compromises. When it's about these UIs and tooling on top, that goes into enterprise. I mean, some salespeople in the past have tried to ask us, like, oh, could you make a little module that makes it go faster in enterprise? Well, no, we don't make a compromise there. Everything goes into open source when it's around execution. And I showed you the list of the starters in open source. Well, there's a bunch more starters in the enterprise. Um, not going to go into detail, but Philip will now show you how the same patterns, the same things you've learned from open source apply to our enterprise story, which is really important because our customers typically start their journey into the open source and then go into enterprise. Yeah. And you will see basically that once you have the Spring Boot know-how, you can easily create global projects and things like that. So let's see. So when we switch, it does not work. Completely. You have to put your finger for a while. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to remove it and add it back again. It definitely doesn't seem to like you. Well, I'm the one that switches from the presentation mode. Nope. <laughs> a new adapter. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so something is happening. I mean, it recognizes that there is something, but... No. Ah, okay. So what did you do? I just touched it a bit. That's why I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right. Uh, so let's now go back to the demo uh, and create a project. So again, uh, we are going to go only through our documentation website. We will use the same project, uh, but yeah, you would go to the same scenario. Basically, go to start.spring.io, create your Spring Boot application with all the dependencies that you want, and we are going to add the flow of all dependencies. So we are going to start first with the dependency management and add basically our bill of, materi uh, bill of materials, that the, all the dependencies that Flowable needs, that Flowable brings, and things like that, right? So, and for that, we need to change the version because now it's the Flowable platform version. And that would be 3.11.7. So that's the, oops, I have a typo, uh, the last version. Then we need to add some of our work dependencies. Uh, we are going to add basically all the dependencies that our platform has. We're going to remove this one because it's going to be pulled by ours. So we're going to add uh, all the dependencies that we need for our platform. Uh, I need to make it bigger. So this would be all the dependencies that we need to run our, our platform, our UI, uh, not our UI, but our, our platform. We have the actuator, so uh, production-ready features which are specific for us. And then we have some things which are around uh, creating users and things, things like that. Uh, and then what we need to add, because this is, of course, uh, so we are at one more dependency, which will help us for our testing. Let's import this. And because this is an enterprise framework and security is really important, we are going to need to add uh, our security configuration. So we have our application security where a customer would basically configure it as they see fit. So if you want to add OAuth, you can add it here. If you have SAML, for whatever reason you're using it, uh, you can configure it and, and use it. Basically, we are completely relying on Spring Security to uh, do the configuration, and, and that's what we are using for security. We have a, a class uh, that allows us to pre-configure certain things so you can extend from it, and then you you can get going. All right, and let's add finally the spring sec the configuration for our actuator fields. And I think that's it. We only need to add the data source. So let me add the quickly the, the data source properties because I have a Postgres database which is running for this. And let's also expose uh, the endpoints there. Uh, before I start it, there will be a problem if I don't do this because I don't have Elasticsearch running. So our platform also has a dependency on Elasticsearch, an optional dependency. 
uh, but for the purposes of this demo, we are going to disable our uh, indexing features and we'll come back to, to these properties and how they're yeah, working. Remember, remember this for a while, this will come back later yeah. in the details of how we do this uh, behind the scenes. Yeah. So let's boot up the application. As, and as you can see, I didn't touch our command line runner. Basically, everything which was done previously with open source, with the APIs which we used before, is still possible, it's still there, nothing changes. Basically. This is, it would be the same way whether you start a process in Flowable Enterprise or in Flowable Open Source. As we can see, we had some more logging here, and we have some more REST endpoints available. But if we scroll and search for our logger server, if I don't make a typo. Yeah, you made a you say he he halo. Yeah. So, so this here is oops, the same logging that we did as before, right? If, now, if you now go to our application, uh, so we can go to 80, port 8080 where the application is running, there is nothing there, so there is no UI uh, and things like that. However, the REST APIs are still available. So we can see here the tasks that have been created uh, for our application. However, we said that we have an enterprise framework that has a UI, right? The reason why there is no UI is because we didn't add it. Uh, because we have customers that don't always need a UI, they build something on their own, but, but for usually they have our own UI. And for this purpose, we are going to add this dependency, which is the dependency that is bringing all the, the resources that we need to have our, to have our front end. And we're going to restart our application. And Let's track and to see that it's booting up. It's in debug mode. So it's initializing, booting up everything. And if we now go to, to our uh, local host 8080, we'll see something else. So now this is our default UI that we have in our enterprise application. If we go to our open processes, we will see that these are the processes that were just booted up when the application started. So we have the, yeah, this is the Spring AI process, just a demo process that, that, uh, that we have for this purpose. All right, so let's now use some of the features that Spring Boot offers us. As you can see here, we, no, these are the options, just remember what we had here. Let's now enable our testing, cap uh, testing infrastructure for our processes. And this is, something which is disabled by default because we, we recommend not to have it enabled in production so the customers have to opt in in their development environments. So this is the inspect feature, which we can easily uh, enable just by, by setting this property to true. So this will uh, trigger a set of uh, basically uh, classes, bins, uh, REST endpoints that will be made available to the application. Uh, and for this purpose, we are relying completely on Spring Boot to basically hook in and check this property, whether it's enabled or not enabled. So if we go back to our application, we restart it. We can now see we have now this show flowable inspect. So this is our drill down tool, which created a lot of different classes hooked into the runtime of the engines. So it did, we did a lot of configurations behind the scenes for you so that we, we expose this functionality to, to, the, to the user. And I think now we go through, yep. through the usages. So to, to basically to show you how we have made this possible I've, and I've what- I've got one couple of slides one first. couple of slides. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe we don't click the buttons. No, yeah, there's all the hidden slides that- <laughs> No, no, no. Ah, yeah, true, true, true. All right. So, I mean, it's hard to show you exactly, um, you know, the depth of all the starters and what's possible. One of the things that Philip, for example, didn't show is that for the last feature with Inspect, that normally a user or a developer would choose then to put those classes on the class part or not, right? What we did was quite lazy now. We just did a whole bundle thing and it gave us all the classes. If you want to build a you know, more constrained microservice, you might not want to do this. And that brings us to this slide where basically we've got two type of customers from, you know, we've got different customers, but two distinct type of customers. The left-hand side, we've got the people who just want to take it, run it, right? That's it. On the other hand, we've got the builders. They want to actually customize it, tweak it to the max. Um, both of them run on very different environments often, you know, typical Tomcats, you know, just as a jar, Kubernetes, all kinds of cloud environments. Some of them are still running on WebSphere, um, you know, but that, that's a similarity. They both want to do high scale, high complexity stuff. 
But the one on the left doesn't really want to do any customizations. He just want to take it, run it, you know, that's it. The one on the right-hand side wants to tweak it, sometimes even completely change the UIs. We've got customers like that. So that's really hard, right? This, and I mean, this is a Spring Boot love story, so it's quite not surprised <laughs> that what the stuff that we've done, and Philip will show you um, in a minute, how we've all done this to support these two very distinct kind of customers and allowed us to really, you know, go into different markets that typically are, you know, one very technical, one non-technical, and still cater for those two. Um, and I'll leave it back to you, Philip. Yes. So as you all know, Spring is an uh, opinionated framework that allows you, the users, to that configures for you a lot of things. And we benefit of these things that Spring Boot configures. For example, the data source, security configurations, transaction, things around logging. It even has third-party integrations, for example, Elasticsearch, Jackson, JMS, and so on. So we are using all these auto configurations, which are already pre-configured and really easily configured by Spring Boot. And it also has additional APIs that it allows you to customize those for your needs, right? So in case you need to change the data source, you can easily do that. And we are going to use that automatically in our application. We also use a lot of the production ready features from the actuator, such as micrometer to publish our metrics. So we completely we use that to publish metrics. And it's on you, on the users, uh, to decide where they want to publish them, right? And it allows us to, as you mentioned earlier, how, how we want to run it. And let's now see some of those usages and how we are using them. Maybe we need to... <laughs> Already touch it, yeah. Uh, I think that's the... Well. So one of the, many of the things will go quite fast now through our code base and show you, um, you know, quite a lot of the low-level stuff. This is stuff that you typically, if you're building a Spring Boot application, don't come into contact with. This is really the kind of frameworky, kind of producty type features. And, you know, we thought it would be interesting to go through it. And I'm trying to fill the time here, Philip. So yeah, but uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, I will touch it multiple times. But let's see now. This worked the previous time. Uh, this one's flickering like crazy. You don't see it, but this one's like. But it, it recognizes that it's connected. So it's ah, I thought it was you all the time. <laughs> ah, wait. ah, okay. All right, so let's go through so how we, we use um, Spring Boot and wh what are the features that Spring Boot allows us to achieve the, the things and opt in into things and stuff like that. So for that purpose, so let's close this so it doesn't... So first, let's go to one of our classes. So this is oh, it's the indexing metrics auto configuration. So this is a class that we have, which is used basically to register a custom meter registry. So for the people that don't know what this is, this is a elastic meter registry, which is for micrometer and publishing metrics to Elasticsearch. And we provide certain uh, different configurations when this is running from the scope of, of flowable, right? And you can see here, there are quite some annotations. And let's go one by one through them and explain what they do and what benefits, the, what kind of benefit gives us this. So the first annotation we can see is the configuration annotation. This is the coming from Spring, has all the configurations and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's the standard annotation for all the configuration. Next, we have the auto configure before annotation. This is the Spring Boot specific annotation, which basically instructs the Spring Boot framework to, to check, to make sure that our configuration class will be scanned before these three classes here are. And the reason for that is that these classes are the ones which are actually providing the elastic meter registry, and we want to make sure that our configuration is seen before the Spring Boot one. So this is what you would do when you are building a framework. When you are a user, you will just define your beans, and everything will be just available there, right? The next one is uh, the auto configure after. So this one means that because we are using certain properties and certain beans from our own configurations, means that our configuration has to be scanned after these two configurations here. So one of, one of them is our own configuration, and then the other one is, is the metrics auto configuration coming from Spring Boot Actuate. So this will make sure that everything works <coughs> properly. Then next is conditional on class. Conditional on class means run this auto configuration, uh, basically the index metrics auto configuration, if this class is available. So 
This means that using this dependency is optional, so you don't have to have Elastic Meter Registry. You can use Prometheus, and then this class will not be invoked at all. And you don't even need them on the class path. You don't right. even need them on the class path, yeah. So th this is what allows us to opt in when something is yeah. available on the class path. Next is the conditional bin annotation. So this annotation uh, basically tells Spring Boot to enable the auto configuration when a specific bin is available. And in this case, this is our own. So this is coming from, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this, coming from uh, the flowable. So it's an index manager which does certain things. But if we disable the indexing like we did before, then this class should not be invoked, right? So there are a lot of conditionals, as you can see in this class. And final but not least, when this needs to be enabled, is on a certain property, right? So in this use case, we are using the same property as, as Spring Boot is using to enable or disable the Elastic Meter Registry because you might have it, you might have everything enabled, you might have the, uh, the dependency on the class path, however, you still want to disable it, for example, in your local uh, dev environment, right? And for this purpose, you can use the pro this property. And when this property is, has the value true um, or is not set, then the configuration needs to be triggered, right? So all of these annotations are used by Spring Boot to decide what to do with this class, whether it should use it or not. And once we have that class, we have finally this conditional missing bean. So this is actually the annotation which allows you as a user to create your own customized beans and allows us to opt out of, of this thing. So basically, if you define your own Elastic Meter Registry, this method will not be invoked, and then the bean which was defined by the user will be used. So as you can see, as a framework, you have, you have to use quite a lot of annotations to make sure that things work properly. Then let's go to another annotation that we are using. So that's the flowable front end auto configuration. So here, apart from the annotations we, I mentioned before, we have this conditional on resource. So as you saw before, uh, initially we didn't have a UI, right? Once we added a dependency, there was, there was a UI in the application. So, and then we have to do certain configurations there, expose certain beans and things like that. And for this purpose, we are using this conditional on resource annotation which basically tells Spring Boot to check uh, whether this resource is available or not. When the resource is available on the class path, then the auto configuration will be tri triggered and we're going to create this home controller and things like that. Then we have the enable configuration properties. Uh, the configuration properties, so this is one of the for me, one of the best features in Spring Boot is that it allows users to really easily configure an application, configure properties either through property files, through YAML files, so, or through system properties and or environmental variables, right? And for this, we, uh, there, you, there is this configuration properties class that exposes the, um, all the properties which you have in your class and puts them, uh, makes, makes them available with this prefix that is here. Right, conditional on available system info, conditional on. We are also you have we also have our own annotations, our own conditions. So you can also do this. Uh, Spring Boot has an API for that that allows you to do certain custom annotations. So for our purpose, we have built an annotation which enables or disables certain providers uh, which we use. And that's done through a system property and only based on the value that is here. And for this, yeah, so if you do look at this, we can see here we are extending the Spring Boot condition that allows you to write custom conditions. And here we use basically a, a, a property which is always there or, or, or it's, it's, it's the same pattern for all the pr uh, properties, all these info providers, and you can easily enable or disable them. Okay, then if you want to register custom filters like we have uh, in our, for example, for our metrics, uh, Spring Boot allows you a really easy way to register custom servlet filters. So we are still a servlet application. So for that purpose, they have the servlet registration bin. 
that uh, is a generic annotation that holds the filter that you want to expose to your to your uh, application. And yeah, it's super trivial to register it. So you create a, a bin, you add the filter that you want to have, and you expose it. The you expose that as a bin. Spring will make sure that it's added to the right place in the in the annotation. The platform REST API configuration. You might also want to register custom dispatcher servlets or custom servlets, basically, that do certain things. Because our application is really big, we have decided to expose all the REST APIs, all the different REST APIs from the different engines that we set, to expose them under their own paths. So the process engine has its own API, the case engine its own API, and so on. And for this purpose, we are using the servlet registration bin uh, that allows you to register your own servlets. And we have two more, I think. So one is, another one basically is an environment post-processor. So environment post-processors are, actu it's actually the way that Spring Boot uses to register all these mechanisms for the externalized configuration. So the system environment properties, the application properties files, and so on. For our purpose, we have created our own post-processors that are actually adding some default properties that we think are better suited uh, for our own application. So the Spring Boot, for example, comes in with the default properties for the data source, I think which is around like two connections, ma maximum 10 connections, while our application needs a bit more. So we have exposed our own properties on, on the class path, and this annotation, this uh, bean makes sure that uh, this will be loaded properly. Oops. I should. <laughs> okay, it's uh, happening again. And finally, but not the least, let's hope that. <laughs> ah, he's seeing that it works there. All right. And the final class that I wanted to show, which is not in our out of the, so it's not in as a dependency to the customers, but it's a it's a class that we've built. Uh, to enable or disable certain features. And this is the auto configuration import filter. So basically, this is a filter that allows us to enable or disable certain auto configurations which are coming from Spring, but with a simple property for our users. For example, when JMS uh, dependency is there, when Rabbit dependency is there, and Kafka dependency is there, Spring Boot will automatically see, OK, I have this on my class path. I need to configure them in a certain way, right? However, it's quite difficult for the user to disable them, or it's not that intuitive. And what we've done is we've added simple properties, like application Kafka enabled, application Robbie enabled, to enable or disable those uh, applications for our out of the box. So this is for the left-hand side uh, image that Yoram showed for those users, so they can easily enable or disable these properties. And I think now we can go back to our presentation. So <coughs> I think we'll do what Philip has, has been in his wonderful tour of the low level yeah. power <laughs> of Spring Boot. Oh, brilliant. Look at that. If I come back, it works immediately. Um, is that there is a lot of Spring Boot that you don't see, that we take for granted. Um, and we as product framework builders, we're using all those nice stuff out of the box to you know, give a similar experience to our users. And there's really a lot to Spring Boot that you don't see, and we wanted to just quickly highlight all of these things. Open source, of course, is also about giving back. So, you know, we are, I mean, this is not a slide to, to, <laughs> you know, to, to be arrogant or something. We try to do the proper thing, give back pull requests, issues. Uh, re recently, we've worked heavily in the area of the REST client for the latest release of Spring Boot. Um, but open source is also giving back to the stuff you use, right? So, <clears throat> I'm uh, conscious of the time, so I'm going a bit, uh, <laughs> but it's due to all the technical issues here, right? Um, so is it all, you know, I said a love story before, right? Is it all really a love story? Well, in software, you know, there is no silver bullet. There's no solution that solves it all. And of course, there's downsides to all the stuff that we've been showing. You might have guessed, but there is a lot of configuration options in the product and the project that we have. Testing all of these permutations, testing all of these different interactions is a lot of hard work. As we are a generic platform, the second point, we ship with a lot of properties. 
it's hard to choose a default that fits everybody. And that seems to be a, a common problem these days is we ship something to customers and people either they le read less or they watch more YouTube these days, but it's really hard then to, to point the customer to, yeah, yeah, we have a configuration for that. Here's the properties. Now people expect that, that the default would be okay, but it is still software, right? Figuring out why something sometimes happen is something that a lot of Spring Boot users will know about. Um, it's all fun until you suddenly have like something doesn't work and then you need to go down into, into the bowels. That is sometimes hard. We know the platform quite well. There is tooling from Spring Boot itself, um, but you need to know quite a bit of things before you actually can be productive. The problem with building on something on the, on the shoulders of giants is that there's a lot to learn. If we have new people in the team, it's really hard for those new people to learn the whole thing. When I started, it was simple. We had Java and we had Swing. Yes, that's how old I am. So I had to learn two things, right? People that join now, they have to learn, you know, Java, Spring, Spring Boot. Well, first you have to learn what dependency injection is, Spring Container. There's a, just a whole bunch of things to learn and the learning curve is quite high. And one of the things is that it's classic for, for people in open source and, and technical people uh, in general is that we have this belief that if you build it, people will come. You know, if you build the best software out there, the next day somebody is waving your euros in your face to, to buy from you. Well, it doesn't work like that. Um, if you put it on GitHub, it doesn't mean you will sell anything. So we've been talking a lot about the technical foundations and that is important. But if you don't have an organization around that, uh, you know, sales, marketing, yes, they are needed. I mean, they are needed for real to, to sell your software. You need a proper support organization, right? It's just not only about the code. Sadly, it would be a better world if it was, but it's not. Now we had uh, five minutes that we wanted to dedicate to Spring Native, but I'm looking at the time and I'm just gonna go quickly over it. The summary is that um, about the innovation is that thanks to building on a platform or a product project like Spring Boot, we can continue to innovate at the pace of Spring Boot. Uh, this is a screenshot, I don't know if you can see it there on the right hand side, Josh is there in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock, we were in the evening and we were hacking at Spring Native. So I think it was January and we did already in April last year, the first implementation, but then they added the Spring Hints uh, recently. So we got together, we made it happen. And the summary of the whole story is that, um, you know, you can boot up this thing that Philip just showed you in the first demo in less than a second and with a handful of RAM. So that's pretty cool. And that, you know, even after 30 years of Java, 25 years of Java, that we still can do that, that's, you know, fantastic. I don't know if you got some parting words, Philip. Yeah, so in a way, like what does the future bring for us? So we are currently on-prem and we are working on towards on-prem and cloud mix uh, with using Spring Boot. Uh, as you've all heard these past few days, so Spring 6 is coming, Spring Boot 3 is coming end of the year. So our plans are also to keep pace as we constantly kept pace with, uh, with Spring Boot and upgrade to it. So most likely it will not be less than a month after it comes because all this also means the Java 17 baseline, so we need to prepare in a better way, uh, mostly prepare our customers than prepare our code base. Our code base is already running on Spring Boot 3. As Jura mentioned, uh, we have already some works with Spring Native, and yeah, I think we can go to conclude, the last right? one. And you can conclude. see that our, yeah. our skills are primarily in the coding area and definitely not in the graphical area. Um, no, I think this, the story I wanted to bring here today, and it's, you know, we only had 50 minutes. There's a lot more to talk around this. You'll find us, you know, in the hallways, talk to us. Um, building an enterprise product on open source is hard sometimes. It's sometimes frustrating. Um, people that do open source will notice. Um, but if you see it working, it is really fulfilling to see your software going into production and knowing that it's running, you know, across the whole wild world. And our thing that we wanted to talk about today is that we couldn't have done this without our foundation, which is, you know, the stuff we've done in open source and Spring Boot. Yeah. And I think that yeah, is perfectly it. timed, even with all the technical yeah. issues that we, we have. We have five more minutes if there are questions, right? Uh, there is a supposedly a microphone. A microphone. Yes, it's coming now, yeah. <clears throat> 
No, I think it's because <laughs> it, yeah, it, we need to hear it in the video. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the presentation in the first place. Um, if working in a small but growing uh, software house, uh, we quickly run into a situation where we have to start building our own, well, now, now internal libraries, mm -hmm. but basically that's, that's the stuff that we're dealing with. Uh, right now. Uh, my question is a little different. Um, if you can disclose that, uh, how do you share uh, the, art, the enterprise artifacts with yeah. your clients? Yeah, that's quite simple. Um, so when an, an enterprise client signs, they get uh, many emails and one of those emails is the credentials to our artifactory. So literally there is a enterprise Maven account, an enterprise NPM account, an enterprise Docker account. And that's it. And that gets managed on an infrastructure level. Okay, so you're not dealing like with, uh, I don't know, um, encrypted jars ah. or something like that? No, we don't know. That was once on the table, that's true, but it brings in a lot of pain for us as a developer. Uh, we do have a license check. Uh, so, so from a, you know, we do, when you boot up, there is a license check, um, but that's it, right? So we don't do any obfuscation of our no. enterprise jars. I mean, we've used, we use products that do that and we, we, oh, we hate it a lot. <laughs> when something goes wrong, you get like a.b.c.exception and it's yeah, pointless. Probably both sides hate it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have a question with the slide, uh, the slide right before this one. You were speaking about on-prem cloud mix and then yeah. uh, major evolutions for yeah. our foundation. Lately, lots of products like pretty much everyone there are creating what's called a managed service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what you're talking here? Yes. Well, I can't disclose this all officially. <laughs> uh, so we, we obviously already run on, on cloud environments. I mean, we got customers that run on a, what we call the private cloud, right? Google, Amazon, a lot of Azure lately. Um, so that's been going on for a while. That's, I mean, for us, that's not really cloud cloud, right? So we're really talking about managed uh, services. But my bosses, uh, yeah. Do not allow me to talk more, more about that at this point in time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned about this struggle of testing all the different configurations. Uh, I suppose that there are a lot of permutations yes. that you have to test. Any advice or anything that you can learn or to to, so chart with us about yeah, that? Yeah. So basically, uh, it's also so the permutations which are not that easy to test, we are actually also benefiting of the way that Spring Boot works to make our tests. So we are, have, we are mostly fans of integration tests because we have a complex framework with a lot of interactions with the database. So we need to test, let's say, on eight, 10 different databases, for example. So what we do, we have different profiles, uh, different configuration op options in our CI, and we basically configure only the, the Spring data source URL parameters, for example, for testing with the different databases. So we would have like 10 different uh, jobs that would run and run the whole entire suite uh, on the yeah. on the. So enterprise. profiles, we have many, many profiles with, you know, this database, this Elasticsearch version, this uh, Kafka, for example, and then another permutation and um, yeah, lots of hard work. I mean, Philip was saying we like yeah. integration testing because it gives you a higher level feedback, but we have a ton of unit tests, but that's primarily in the open source. Right there, we can really unit test the behavior yeah, from the engine. But, but so from that perspective, from, we are actually quite lucky. But, but from the purest point of view, those are not integration. No. Not, those no. are not unit tests. They're still integration tests because they communicate with the database. Well, that's the discussion I want to have then yes. with the purest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, the engine starts super fast and yeah. it allows us to have those tests and allows us to easily refactor things without mocking things and stuff like that. I think there are no more questions. I think we can close the session. And yeah, if you want to ask us something, we are around here. Oh. All right. I think the screen can be disabled now. Oh, you can <laughs> yeah, you can remove it.